that was a fun tune by our very own Seaside Band. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Seaside. Thank you for tuning in with us. You're in for a wonderful message this morning. But I'm going to start us out, try to get centered this morning. And we we'll hope you all... Rebecca, thank you, band. So good to have you guys here. Yeah. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Good. You feeling good? Feeling, feeling healthy? Feeling good. Yeah, I'm happy. Good. Life is good. And, you know, considering everything happening, we're still maintaining. You we know, are so. plugging along. It's hard to believe we're, like, coming up almost on a year on this. Oh, <laughs> man. Good. Yeah, who knew? We good. thought, oh, a few weeks, few months, right? Here yeah, we are. That's exactly it. Wow. And, and funny, I, you know, I look back and I was like, Looking forward to, you know, I was like, we, we, I was super busy and it yeah. was good, things were good. And I'm like, you know, okay, take a couple of weeks, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Two oh, weeks yeah. turned into two months, which turns into, after like that, I was like, okay, we, we can get back we to it. We can go Whatever. now, yeah. So okay. what are you doing? You got something going on? Yeah, you, have you know, okay, just, good. just like how things are going, you know, we're doing a live, um, you know, lots of live stream concerts yeah. and actually doing one with Peter Sprague this coming Thursday. And it's a Pat Metheny tribute. So, yeah, yeah, so it's just okay. on YouTube and... Um, so just Google, Rebecca yeah, J, you can follow, Peter Strick. I'll, uh, I'll have it up on my page as well, but okay. um, on, um, not on my YouTube page. It'll just tap in Peter Sprague for, for okay. his page to find it on there. But it's a 6.30, it's a free concert, and um, we'd love it for people to tune in. Cool, yeah. something to do on Thursday night. There we go. There exactly. you go. Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you. It's so wonderful that we've had all these opportunities to listen to our musicians, our new thought musicians, and just the musicians in our community have been offering us such great gifts of music. It's, it's been wonderful. Speaking of gifts, we have a gift here at Seaside today. We have a practitioner with us today who is a new practitioner to Seaside, not a new practitioner. She's entered the School of Ministry, and she's actually come on staff here at Seaside as our new head of education. We're very, very blessed to have her, and uh, she is here today to pray us in and do a reading for us. Practitioner Jennifer Diallo. Thank you, Rev Debbie. I'm so delighted to be at Seaside. It's my great joy to work in the education department and to bring classes and, and opportunities to learn and grow and, and evolve in our spiritual practice. And I just want to mention that we do have some more things coming up this winter term. 
So if you haven't um, jumped in yet, we have the sacred circles that are ongoing. We also have a Reiki circle that's coming up, which is a great opportunity to practice distance healing for those loved ones that might be far away or even close by, but you can't see them because of social distancing. So that's coming up next Saturday and watch our website and the swag this week to see what's going on Seaside Week at a glance. Um, I'll also be teaching a class next month, and we have another prayer class coming up. My class is about expanding consciousness, and it's a great refresher for these times where we really need to um, think about our spiritual practice and, and remember to practice it and to stay in alignment. So I'm delighted to be able to offer that class here and look for more of our education offerings. As we turn within, lighting this candle, I invite you to illuminate your heart as well, to open your heart and your mind to the message arriving from spirit today. This presence, this all-providing source of infinite love, wisdom, prosperity, kindness, compassion, this presence is all that is. And as I rest in this knowing, uniting myself with the one mind, the one heart, trusting and knowing that as I hear the word today, there is something here for me. And so I'm so grateful for the opportunity to join together virtually for now and in person as we come back together soon. reading today 
is from the book Endless Practice by Mark Nepo. And it's about our ring of fear. Each of us has a ring of safety we carry around with us. If something threatening, unexpected, or violent should cross that ring, we experience legitimate danger and need to respond to protect ourselves. But we also have a ring of fear that often extends beyond, far beyond our legitimate safety. And we mistake the ring of fear for the ring of safety and keep the world farther away than necessary. The ring of fear we inherited may tell us we are in danger, when in truth it is much farther to our ring of safety. In a very personal way, our daily practice is to bring our ring of fear into congruence with our ring of safety. When we start to fear people and experiences with no real need, we keep life farther away and we begin to feel isolated and disconnected. Out of touch, we become disheartened and our level of fear increases until we may feel more threatened and more insecure, spiraling into a doom loop. We each have work to do to align our ring of fear with our ring of safety. On any given day, they may drift apart and we need to bring them back into accord. It's part of what we do with what we feel. The distance between these two rings is a barometer of my well-being. Dissonance between my ring of fear and my ring of safety tells me that my insecurity is agitated and I'm not centered. When we allow our ring of fear to extend beyond real danger, we risk doing harm to others by perceiving threat that isn't real and then protecting ourselves by striking out when there is no need. And we can retreat when we're actually safe. The practice of being human is to know the difference between our reflexive ring of fear and our actual ring of safety, and to always bring the two into alignment, to see things as they are. What a wonderful reading. Thank you so much. Well, Seaside, good morning. It is my honor to introduce our guest artists on Sunday mornings, and we're so Oh, all in for a wonderful treat. I already got to hear her for 9 a.m. service, and you all are about to hear her right now. Um, she drives down to be with us from Los Angeles. She's incredibly talented. She's not only a very talented singer, she's a wonderful person, and we're just so, I'm just so grateful I've gotten to know her over the years of being here with us at Seaside. She recently released a new single, it's called Ghost. Please follow, follow her, check out that song. And without further ado, let's give a warm seaside welcome to Rain Bijou. Such a pleasure to be here this morning. To be transforming live and in action with all of you, transforming, ascending, and just filled with pure gratitude for that evolution constantly happening.
Christmas rain. Oh my gosh. What a beautiful song. What a beautiful song. God is all there is. You know, I'm going to tell my little story about rain. <laughs> back, back in the day, we had Wednesday night service here, and um, I think it was my final Wednesday night service before I left to go up to uh, Monterey, and we were going to do a, a young adult service, and it was the minister's convention. Our, our whole sanctuary was full, which was magnificent for our Wednesday night, and rain was our singer, and oh my goodness. That's been like, what, five years ago now, and look where you are, and you're just amazing. So grateful that you're here. Thank you very much. Oh, my goodness. Well, as you might notice, Dr. Christian is not here. It's me, Reverend Debbie McDonald. I'm the assistant minister here at Seaside, and Dr. Christian is up in his Montana ranch writing a book. He's got a new book coming out, uh, hopefully the end of this year. So he's writing his book, and I think he's skiing a little bit. And he emailed this morning and sends his love to everybody. But uh, everybody, well, you should know, ministers need a little R&R. &R. It's a full-time, 24-7 job. You're never really off. So we, we honor him for taking some much-needed rest. So around Seaside, we are using this book, Our Moment of Choice, uh, I know a lot of you got it during the pledge program. A lot of you have it. Uh, so this is what we are using for our sacred circles this year. And we're doing our sacred circles a little bit different. We're doing them every other week instead of every week. And we're stretching it out to about the first six months of the year. And we've had one circle so far, and the next one is coming up this week. So it's not too late to join a sacred circle. You could just go on our website, pick a day and a time. And there's one or two of them that are full, but most of them are still open. And what it is is an opportunity to take the Sunday message down deeper. So each um, time that the sacred circle is, they, they'll, they'll, use, they'll use that Sunday message and, they'll, uh, and you'll get to have some experientials around it. You'll get to talk about it a little bit more. It's always led by a practitioner. They're written by our beautiful Jennifer Diallo and we're so grateful for that. So join a sacred circle if you haven't. This week we are on um, the book has circles in it, so not to be confused with our sacred circles, but the book is made up of a series of circles, and we're in the second circle, which is chapter 6 through 10 in the book. And the second circle is restoring ecological balance. We regard the universe as alive and conscious. We are planetary stewards. So that's what the second circle is all about. And Dr. Christian chose the chapter six to focus on in the sacred circle, and that is evolutionary wisdom for a world in great transition. One of the very interesting things about this book is it was written and planned and envisioned several years ago, you know, before the pandemic, and it's come out at a perfect time, which is the way God works. It's just perfect. It always unfolds perfectly. So three of the points that are made in this circle are, well, the first one is earth is a living thing. This the indigenous, the indigenous people knew and lived. We think back to uh, the Native Americans or the Aborigines and those that were here way before white man arrived. They knew that they were one with all that is. They knew that they were one with the earth, one with the planet. Luther Standing Bear, a Lakota elder, said, There was no such thing as emptiness in the world. Even in the sky, there was no vacant places. Everywhere there was life, visible and invisible. And uh, you might uh, notice that sometimes in prayer, you hear a practitioner say, seen and unseen, visible and invisible. We talk about all that there is, and not all that there is can we see. Uh, a report out of Stanford said that 96% of all the known universe is invisible to our physical senses. 96%. That means that we are only really knowing and seeing and experiencing 4% with our, with our senses. We may intuit some of that 96%, we may feel some of that 96%. But the visible and invisible, seen and unseen, 
In our Science of Mind textbook, Ernest Holmes says it like this, in universal mind is contained the essence of everything that ever was, is, or shall be. The seen and the unseen are in it and governed by it. It is the sole and only creative agency in the universe and all other apparent agencies are it working in different ways. The seen and unseen. So what we see with our eyes is a very small percentage of what's really going on. You know, we live in this world, and I like to think of it as like a quantum soup, and I didn't originate that. I think that's from Deepak. But we live in this world where matter is not really solid. You know, this may seem like a solid thing to us, but it's truthfully not. If we could see that 96% that we can't see, we would know that this is a swirling mass of atoms and particles, and, and it's, it's not solid at all. It's only when we look at it that it becomes solid. You know, quantum physics is one of the things that we take in ministerial school and it's just absolutely fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating what science is now proving when early um, philosophers and writers and theologians knew some of this stuff intuitively even before it was uh, scientifically proven. You know, Ernest Holmes' last talk was at the Downey Center for Spiritual Limmy and it's a famous talk because in the talk he had a mystical experience right in the middle of the talk. And you can hear it in his voice. You can listen to it. I believe it's on YouTube. If not, you can Google it and find it. But it's his, um, he stops and he pauses and he says, the veil is very thin or becoming very thin. And he's talking about that veil between the seen and the unseen. He glimpses the other side, if you will, for a moment. And, uh, uh, you know, so not everything that we see is all that there is. There's so much more going on. The universe is continuously emerging as a fresh creation at every moment. That's the second point of this circle. The universe is continuously emerging as a fresh creation at every moment. You know, we know and we've learned that our body, our cells reproduce themselves every seven to 10 years. Like we have a whole new body. That's great news. <laughs> That's great news for me anyway. You know, I want a whole new body every seven years. And, uh, you know, uh, it was said in the Islam uh, religion like this. You have a death and a return in every moment. Every moment the world is renewed, but we, in seeing its continuity of appearance, are unaware of it being renewed. And that's Rumi. That's from Rumi. And the third point is we belong to the earth. Not the other way around. The earth doesn't belong to us. We belong to the earth. And some of us have grasped that contest, got that concept, and some of us haven't. You know, we belong to the earth. You know, until we fully grasp that, we are going to be out of sync with our planet. Until we really get that we are one with all that is. You know, our teaching says that. Our teaching says that there is only one. There's only one thing happening here, and that is God expressing. That is God expressing as you, God expressing as me, God expressing as the tree, God expressing as the ocean. There is only one thing happening here, and we are part of that. We are part of that. Uh, Daniel Awal, who in chapter 7 of the book, he says this. For too long have we separated self from the world, culture from nature, mind from matter, and lived within this illusion of separation that made us behave like masters rather than stewards of the earth. Our role now is to create conditions conducive to life. We were living like masters instead of stewards. How can I be a steward of our planet? How can I be a steward of our world? I mean, what are you doing to be the change? There's so many little things we could do, and I hope that we're all doing the little things, but I know that we're not all. But are we recycling? I mean, that's very simple. Are we recycling? Are we using reusable bottles and glasses? Have we stopped buying the bottled water at the store? Are we um, repurposing? 
Are we repurposing our furniture and the things that we no longer need? Are we using them in a new and different way? Are we gifting them to somebody? Are we taking them to a Salvation Army or to Goodwill or to some place where somebody else could adopt them? Are we conscious consumers or are we just buying things because we like to buy things? Do we need them? Is our house full of clutter? What does our carbon footprint look like? Are we living sustainably? I mean, these are all things that we can be doing right here and right now to be good stewards of our planet. Each one of us can do that. Systems thinker and Dharma teacher. Doesn't that sound like a kind of a cool job? Systems thinker and Dharma teacher. Joan Macy writes this. We are now playing dual roles. Hospice workers to a dying world and midwives of a regenerative future. Yeah, right? We have two roles. We're caring for, we're in hospice with that which is dying, but we're also in the process of rebirth, helping that which wants to be rebirthed. Where are you midwifing a regenerative future? If I ask, and if you're not, I ask you, why not? Where are you doing that in your world? You know, and whose job is it to do it? Oh, those other people will do it. Those other people will figure out a way to save the planet. Those other people will figure out a way that we can have clean water. Those other people will figure out a way that everyone can have food. No, we are part of everybody, right? It is up to us. We as individuals, we are called at this time to do it different. How can we? How can we do it different? You know, we are in a world, we are a people in transition. And this has been amplified by the pandemic, by the COVID pandemic. There are those that say we're in three pandemics, a pandemic of COVID, a pandemic of fear, as Jennifer read about, and a pandemic of misinformation. This is written by the evolutionary leaders. The human family is in the midst of the most significant transformation of consciousness since its emergence in Africa over 100,000 years ago. Consciousness has been evolving for billions of years from the first cell to us. We are becoming aware that through our own consciousness, the universe can know itself. This awareness reveals incredible new potential for our individual and collective humanity. By our own consciousness, the universe can know itself. There is a uh, prophecy of the eagle and the condor. And this prophecy is about 2,000 years old. And uh, how the prophecy goes is about 2,000 years ago, humanity split itself into two. There were those that followed the eagle path and those that followed the condor path. And those that followed the eagle path followed the path of science and industry. And those that followed the condor path followed the path of heart and spirituality and nature. And the prophecy goes that for many, many years they would not... Uh, collide. They would not meet these two paths. But in the fourth Pashakuti, Pashakuti, it's uh, Andy's language, um, which was about 15 AD, the prophecy said that they would merge and that the eagle would almost destroy the condor. And the prophecy goes on to say that 500 years later, there would be a time once again where they would merge and the eagle and the condor would come together and they would mate and give birth to a higher consciousness. And that time is now. That time is now. It is a time when uh, those that are um, teachers of Mother Earth, the indigenous, are wanting to share their wisdom with us, how to live in one with all that is. And so the two sides are coming together and we have this opportunity to be in this place of higher consciousness. The prophecy was fulfilled in 1492 with Columbus's time when the eagle almost wiped out the condors, the indigenous people, when the white man came to America. Almost, but they did not. 
So this is the prophecy. This is uh, told by John Perkins, who's one of the authors in the book. Um, you know, this book is an amazing book, Our Moment of Choice, you know, and, and I'd like to tell you I read it all the minute we got it, but I didn't. And I've been reading it in preparation for this talk today, and it is a fabulous book. So number one, if you don't have it, get it. Read it along with us. As I said, you're going to have six months to read along and to follow along with it. But one of the things that happened for me as I was researching today's talk, as I went to the website, as I was looking up one of the authors to get more information about one of the authors in the book, and their website is evolutionaryleaders.net. Evolutionaryleaders.net. And in it, there was a section titled, Evolutionary Resources on the Coronavirus. Evolutionary Resources on the Coronavirus. I thought, oh my God, this is crazy. Three pages, three pages of titles of blogs and articles and things that were written by these evolutionary leaders. A different way of looking at what's going on in the world, a different way of looking at this pandemic of fear, of looking at the pandemic of misinformation, of looking at the pandemic of COVID. You know, these are just a couple of the titles. Pandemic as Opportunity. Now well, that's pretty science of mind, wouldn't you say? Mother Earth and Humans, Reflections in Corona Time. In this time of the great pause, we need to seek a higher faith rather than a worldwide fear. It's just a small sample of some of the articles. So I, I uh, suggest, if you're interested in that, to go to that website and take a look. They introduce a way to look at things, you know, a different way to look at things than what you're going to see on the nightly news that you're going to see, even on the news that's a little more uh, enlightened, if you will. They introduce a completely different way of looking at things, a way that's more in alignment with our science of mind philosophy. I found it very comforting. There's a story in the book, one of the authors, Constance Buffalo, and I was intrigued by her chapter. She tells a couple stories in there, but the story that I want to share with you is the story uh, that happened to her. Um, she was a Native American woman, a Chippewa, and she was living in Denver, Colorado, and uh, was driving to do a um, retreat sort of thing, and she went to the town of Kremlin, Kremlin, Colorado, where she checked into Bob's Western Motel. And when she checked into the hotel, she said she just felt a deep sadness come over her. She just had this feeling of deep sadness. And she mentioned it to the receptionist, and the receptionist said, well, maybe it's because of all the animal trophies on the walls in the office next door. And Constance thought, no, it's not that. It's something deeper. And then as she was standing at the counter, she looked up and she saw a bow and an arrow and on the end, two scalps hanging, two human scalps. She said they were about 12 inches long and sewn together with a pink thread. And she just felt the sorrow to the marrow of her bones. She just felt the sorrow in her whole body, the sadness. And she left there and, and got, went on her drive after she had checked in. And she was going to do her annual recommitment ceremony, an annual ceremony that she did to recommit to her spiritual path. And as she got in her car and was driving, she saw in her passenger seat an elder Indian man wrapped in a blanket. Now, she knew he wasn't really there. She knew he was a spirit. She knew he was an apparition, but he guided her. He guided her on the roads, and she listened, and she intuitively heard what he had to say, and he took her to a precipice where she stopped, and she could see nothing but a lake and stars. And she said she couldn't tell where the stars ended and the lake began and vice versa. And she sat there and she started to smoke her peace pipe and the uh, spirit guide said no. He said the time is now for reconciliation. The time is now to take those scalps and give them an honorable burial. The time is now to heal the past. The time is now to pray for those that committed the uh, crime and for those that the crime was committed to. And then when that is complete, you can smoke your pipe. And she sat there, she says, for a very long time, just looking at the lake and looking at the sky and reflecting. She found her way back to the motel without her spirit guide. And in the morning when she woke up, she went to the counter and she found behind the counter Bob. 
Bob of the Western Hotel, and he was in his blue jeans and plaid shirt and suspenders. And uh, she struck up a conversation with him, and she asked him, about the skulls hanging on the wall. And he said, my great-great-grandfather was in the battle. And she said softly, it wasn't a battle, it was a massacre. What had happened 156 years earlier, uh, 1964, I believe it was, that um, there, the Big Kettle tribe had had a peace treaty. And their camp was set up, and in the center of the camp was an American flag and a white flag that said that they were at peace. And they were just finishing up the signing of the treaty. And so all the men went out hunting, figuring everything was great, right? But that night, I believe it was November 28th, one of the army officers showed up with 675 soldiers, and he told them to kill every single Indian there old and young, and now there was mostly women and children there. And they scalped every single one of them, 130 to 150, it's estimated. And they took all those scalps to Denver where they hung them in front of the Apollo Theater and sold them for one pair of boots each. You know, it was a massacre. It was a massacre, and Bob said, quietly, what can I do to make this right? And Constance says, it's time. It's time for a proper burial. And he handed them uh, the, the, the bow and the scalps to her and walked away with tears in his eyes. And she wrapped them in a bundle and she tied the colors of the four directions and she took that bundle home. And she put it on her altar, and she sang the songs that she knew. She didn't know the songs of the tribe that these Indians had came from, but she knew her songs. And she reached out to her elders, and they made the plans to have this burial at Sand Creek, and they got permission to bury them, their dead there and to uh, do what they needed to do. And 12 of them went to the spot to do the burial. And when they got there, the men walked around and kind of got a lay of the land. They, heard, they quickly came back because they said they could hear the voices of the camp. The camp was still alive. And they continued to pray. They had a sweat lodge. They did the purifications. They did the prayers. They did the rituals. They did the songs. And finally, they did the burial. There was a few birds, she said, that were just circling around, flying around, not even circling. She said that they were just there for the whole time, but as soon as the scalps were buried, the birds flew away. Time of reconciliation, a time of forgiveness, a time of coming together, a time of letting go of our, our past history and stepping into a new way of being. Chief Seattle said this, all things are connected. What befalls the earth befalls the sons of earth. This we know. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites them. Man does not web, weave this web of life. He is merely a strand of it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. We are all connected. We are all one. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Matthew, right? We are all connected. We are all one. You know, as we move into this new world, as we move into this reopening, as we start to go out into the world in a new and different way after this great pause that we've had that was much longer than any of us thought it was going to be, how are we going back out in the world? Are we conscious? What is it that we want to take with us? What are those things that we, what are the habits? What are the thoughts? What are the beliefs that we want to carry on? And what are the ones that we want to get rid of? What are the ones we want to release? How do we want to show up in this new world? Do we want to show up in that place of higher consciousness? Do we want to show up as a steward of our planet? Or do we want to go back to the way it's always been? We've been given a gift, you know, we've been given a gift of this pause. You know? And so I ask you, 
Are you willing to be a steward of our planet as you move back out into the world? God bless you. I'm so glad that you're here today. So good to have you. Blessings to you all. God bless you. Welcome back to our stage, Rain. Good morning once again. What a beautiful message. I think my favorite part had to be the hospice care and the midwives. I definitely feel like we're in the middle of releasing in order to make room for something new. It just feels like the world imploded to create this expansion. And we're no longer on survival mode. We are ready to thrive. You ready, band? and you can come and be with, I mean, not super close, but close enough to come see us. Yeah. Oh, we're blessed. We're blessed by our musicians, led by our wonderful Rebecca Jade. Oh, well, it's the time of our service for our offering, and we don't do it the normal way because you're not here. So what we do is we have lots of opportunities for you to give. We have ways to give a Venmo. We have the button that you can just push to make a donation online. We have text to give, but you should be able to see it right there. There's a big donate button. We appreciate it. We are grateful for every uh, penny that we receive. Please know that we do need to continue to have resources to keep the doors open. 
You know, so very, very grateful for all that you're able to give. Let us join together in our affirmation, which is, Spirit continues to bless my world. Gratefully, I live as the giving expression of Spirit, opening the floodgates of the affluent flow of greater good as my life now. Seaside Band, thank you guys for always being here. Especially thank you to Rebecca and Rain. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer, for being here and holding the consciousness and being our practitioner. Matt, thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do. Tim and Edwin and Tom and Steve. Guys, we couldn't do it without you. You're amazing. Thank you for your gifts. I have a few announcements. Let's see. Sacred circles, I already said. Sign up, sign up, sign up. Be part of a sacred circle. Uh, also, we have, Jennifer has created this new thing in education, which is called practices. So we had classes and we had workshops, but now we have classes, workshops, and practices. So they're ongoing um, groups that you can join where you can have a continuous practice. So we already have Rebecca Berry's breath work. That was one. We have a Reiki circle that's starting up. I think it's starting Saturday. We have Tai Chi with Dr. Christina Tillotson. So check those out on the website. We have some new opportunities there. Um, also, Dr. Christina and Valerie, the Reiki teacher, are starting up the wellness group again. So I think that's Saturday the 21st. There's going to be a coming together. Oh, no, I think it's a Sunday. Anyway, look on the website. They're going to have an informational meeting and starting up our wellness group again. Um, all those classes that Jennifer told you about, the practitioners are available for prayer right after service. You go into the Zoom room, you go into a private room with a practitioner and you receive a prayer. Please, please, please utilize our practitioners. If there's anything on your heart, anything you're needing prayer for, please reach out, get a prayer. Uh, and next Sunday is a love Sunday. It's Valentine's Day. And Dr. Christian's going to be doing the renewing of the vows. I don't know how many years he's done it for, but he does it all the time. And he does it, he's going to do it between services next week on this live stream platform. So you're going to log on just like you're logging on to service with your honey and your partner and renew your vows. That's going to be at 1020. So plan on logging on a little bit early at 1020 next week. So Dr. Christian will be back with you and he will be doing the renewing of the vows and uh, that's all the announcements that I have but what I'd like to do now is I'd like to pray um, so let's do that return within feeling and knowing and sensing the one the one power the one presence the one love the one light knowing that God is all that there is God good love whatever name I call it I know there is only one spirit and I know that I am one with this divine energy. I know that I am an individualized expression of the one. And just as this is true for me, it's true for each one. Each one here within the sound of my voice, each one on the planet is an individualized expression of the divine. Perfect, exactly as they are. I know that each one is a perfect emanation of spirit. On purpose, here, at this time, for a reason. And I know for each one a perfect unfoldment of their lives. I know that spirit goes before them and makes straight any crooked places. I know that it is in God that they live and breathe. They have their very being. If there's any sense of lack or limitation, I know that that just dissipates back into the nothingness from which it came. I know that there is only wholeness and abundance, good health, thriving relationships, harmony and peace. 
I know this is the truth for each one. I know for our planet that it is being renewed. It is being renewed in every moment, that the old is dying away and the new is being born. Right now, right here, as I say these words, there's new ways of being in the world, new ways of operating, new ways of communicating with each other, new ways of planting, new ways of thriving. So grateful for it all. So grateful for that mind of God that is individualized as each mind here. That all that needs to be known is known. All that we need to know to continue to thrive on this planet is known now. For all those that have written a prayer in our prayer request chest, I know that those prayers are answered. I know that those prayers are answered before they are even spoken. That it is the Father's good pleasure to give each one the kingdom. I know for Seaside Center for Spiritual Living that it is absolutely sourced to do all the work that we've been called to do in the world, to continue to have our ministries, to continue to keep our doors open, to continue to bring you Sunday service and our education classes, our training, our practitioner training, our ministerial training, all the work that we do. It's absolutely sourced. I know for all those that have lost a loved one that there is peace right where they are that there is love where they are, that God is right where they are. And we know that no one ever really dies. We transform into that next expression, that next place of being. So with a heart full of joy and gratitude for all that we've been given, for all that's been taken away, and for all that's remained, that I just simply release these words into the divine nature of the law, knowing in the mind of God it is already done, it's complete. There's nothing left for us to do but just allow it to be. And together we say, and so it is. There was a time in my life I thought I had to do it all for myself I didn't know the grace of God was sufficient I didn't know the love of God was at hand But now I can say If you are discouraged Struggling just to make it through another day You've got to let it go time. I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. And so it is. God bless you.